Hello and welcome to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and you're listening to CITR 101.9 FM in Vancouver on unceded Musqueam territory at the University of British Columbia campus. Or you might be listening online at citr.ca, cosmicdimensions.com, empowerradio.com, on the co-creator network, or on my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash spiritual show. Today, we are speaking, we have Susan Semenu live in studio, and she is the head matchmaker from Divine Intervention Matchmaking. They are a national company, a boutique hands-on specialty agency that helps people find their life partner. You can find them at divinematchmaking.com. Welcome to the show, Susan. Thanks for having me, Marie. Great thank, to be here. Thank you. So just to get things started, how did you get involved in matchmaking and why do you do it? First of all, people in this business do it because they love people and they love love. So I got into this business after successfully doing it for fun. I would always find someone a partner or find them a job. And I was looking for a career change uh, over nine years ago from the corporate world into something a little bit differently. And then this kind of fell into my lap after I started doing some research. And I thought I could do a little bit better than some of the options that, that were already out there. Awesome. So you, the, the headquarters is in Vancouver. You work all over the country, though. Yes. And now Vancouver, even uh, the, the host of Millionaire Matchmaker, even she admits Vancouver is one of the toughest cities for dating in the world. Well, Vancouver has a bad reputation in terms of, I love this analogy that someone said Vancouver is a little bit like a supermodel just in general, uh, in terms of a demeanor. So very beautiful from the outside, but often difficult to approach. And we are known for being a challenging city in terms of dating where men might not approach women. Women don't really want to talk to men. And I call it a bit of a Mexican standoff in terms of what's going on here. We have great single people though in this market and um, we just need to change things, you know, one couple at a time. Mm. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, I noticed there's there's so many single people with the meetups that I do. And they all, it, it's still almost like a high school dance, though. If you're not actively pulling people together and getting them to talk, it's men on one side, women on the other. Well, one of the things just about people in general, whether you're single, whether you're new to the city, um, you have to be proactive in your life if you want to make a change. So standing on one corner is not going to do anything for you. And if a guy does approach you as a single woman, even if you're not interested, take it as a compliment and say, you know what, thanks for coming over. I'm taken and I'm flattered and I appreciate it. And the guy will retreat, but do not be mean. And then women need to signal men that it's okay to come over. And often we travel in packs and people are fearful. People are fearful of rejection, especially single people. So a lot of that is carried on as well. And, you know, one of the things in dating, you can't take things personally. You either connect with someone or you don't. I always say honesty is the best policy. And if it doesn't work out, you can always be gracious and nice to someone and then just move on in a positive way. Mm, I really love that because that's the thing. It takes the the amount of confidence and and guts it takes even for a very attractive person to approach a complete stranger and 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 start talking to them it's a lot and so many times people can be mean if the guy if they don't feel like the guy meets their standards but guess what someone else in the room who might be interested in you sees you treat him or her poorly he's not coming over because men don't like mean girls i can tell you right now that is a fact and I also say karma's a bitch. So always be nice to someone. And you know what I tell people too, if you are nervous, there's extroverted people and introverted people. And practice makes perfect. You can meet someone anywhere, squeezing a cantaloupe at Safeway, for example. So one of the key things I tell people is you need to be engaged with life wherever you are. And I love the elevator conversation. So what I like to do when I come in here in an elevator is actually face people. And what you have to do is just a quick scan on people, notice something about them and compliment, a genuine compliment just to open up the door. So if you're out at a singles event, 
Um, you get in the habit of just talking to strangers. And you know what? A smile goes a long way. If you're nervous, just smile, maintain eye contact, and hopefully someone will open the mouth and just say hello. Just be normal when you approach someone. Like, don't do cheesy pickup lines or anything like that. Just normal. So practice those types of interactions all the time. Awesome. Right now, we are speaking with Susan Semenu. She is the head matchmaker at Divine Intervention Matchmaking, and you can find her at divinematchmaking.com. Calm. Now, we were going to talk about some of the attitudes that, that need to change around dating for people to be more successful. Um, and you also help your clients if they don't have a lot of experience with dating. So what do you think is more important to focus on first, the attitudes or getting practice? We can talk about attitudes. Um, so positive attitudes are everything a positive attitude and perspective so no one wants to be around someone who's a downer or who's negative so you've got to get your head in the game and you need to believe that there are good people out there another thing that's really important too is try to get over your past we tend to carry that negative stuff forward so you know what park it and say from this day forward i'm going to have a different approach I'm going to be positive, I'm going to believe in myself, I'm going to maximize my attitude, and I'm going to maximize my assets. So what does that mean? Um, You've got to look good, number one, in terms of having the right attitude. So invest in yourself um, in terms of how you want to package yourself up. And then, um, I don't know, I'm just trying to look here in terms of attitude as well. You. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Marie. You you talk about um, practice because that's the thing. I think that we get into this way of being, and a lot of women. I remember when I was a teenager, I used to think that that like supermodel Zoolander, like you know, was was sexy, and then I'd see pictures of myself not smiling, and I looked terrible. So, I mean, a smile makes you 10 times more attractive. Well, they actually have done studies. So men love women who smile. And women are actually a little bit attracted to men who kind of like, I don't want to say look menacing, but, you know, they look more large and in charge. Uh So I always tell the dudes, take up some space. But women, friendly, smile, inviting, that signals that you're ready. And a guy's afraid of rejection. So you want to cue them that way. But in terms of attitude, I'm going to go back to uh, a couple things. Number one, women need to understand that the male of this species is a very simple creature. (laughs) So, and I do not say that in a negative way. So um, they are visually and sexually driven, and it's not necessarily for a supermodel. Women come in all shapes and sizes. So when I said earlier, you need to maximize your assets, you know, what are the things that make you look good and make you feel good so that's what you need to work on and you need to invest to like get your hair done your makeup you know vancouver is a very fit city so you know that's a big part of our lifestyle so just understand from the female perspective that you're not going to change the way that men are they sort of respond to women overall like in a fifth of a second on a subconscious level And their mission, it's all about being back in the jungle, is about procreation and self-preservation for the human race. Same with women as well. So that's why, you know, we're looking for a certain partner. Um, And what women have attitude-wise typically is that they're driven by financial security, stability, money. They want to know they're not going to end up with someone who's a bum. So those are kind of the two things that we kind of look for. But universally, men, when I say they're simple too, they let things go off their list. They don't have massive lists. They'll look at someone, they'll look at you, Marie, and say, you know what? I like Marie. I want to get to know her better. Whereas the female of the species, in terms of the attitude, typically, you know, wants height, wants hair, wants money, wants Brad Pitt, you know, in his wallet. Like there's a lot of things that we want on our list that we're often not prepared to let go. And that's not how you fall in love. Like you fall in love with the package. It's about energy. And there's some people that you meet, whether it's a girlfriend or a friend that's a boy, and you shake their hand or you look at them and you're like, wow, I really like this person. And they may not be 
you know, someone that you were expecting to like. And conversely, someone that looks fantastic on paper, you just don't have a connection with. So attitude is everything. And being open, I cannot tell you how important that is. Because you can fall in love with any type of package. And over and over and over again, I see people kind of going, wow, you know, that's not the person I thought I would fall in love with. Hmm. So that's important. Um, another thing that's really critical as well is that you need to look under the surface. We all like good looking people, but I say go to an airport and watch the human race go by. I mean, we're everyone looks differently. We're not a world of tens or nines. I mean, you have to look below the surface for a long term relationship. If you don't have common ground and compatibility, it doesn't matter how hot and sexy someone is, it's not going to work. Okay, Susan. Well, before before I ask you the next question, we are speaking with Susan Semenu. She is the head matchmaker at Divine Intervention Matchmaking. You can find them at divinematchmaking.com. Now, you mentioned tens and nines, and there are a lot of tens and nines in this beautiful Hollywood-esque city of Vancouver. But I notice, especially through... Um, the, the singles groups that I do and stuff, uh, and I hope I'm not calling anyone out, but I notice that there are a lot of fours, fives, and sixes that either think they're tens or they're after tens. And it's really frustrating because I will try and match them up just out of the goodness of my heart with people who I think they might be compatible with. And they're like, no, he's not tall enough. He doesn't have any money. He's too dorky or whatever. So what do you have to say about this phenomenon of sixes aiming for tens? I'm laughing as I'm looking at Marie secretly because I always say the world is filled with fives or sixes thinking they're eights looking for tens. And that's what a lot of matchmakers say as well. And in my experience, it's often the most beautiful people on the outside. I'm just talking superficial who can be the most open in terms of looks because they already have the look. So they're not looking for someone to validate them. Mm. And I find a lot of average looking people uh, because they might not have the looks, let's say of someone else, those are the ones that are the least open that are the most focused on getting someone better looking because it sort of validates them. Just sometimes how someone short wants someone tall because they don't have the height or there's a lot of, if someone's dark, they may want someone who's light. I mean, it's often the opposite of what you are. So you can go through life looking for that 10. You're going to be disappointed. So again, it gets back to being open. And, you know, matchmakers, people come to us thinking we can custom order a human being off a menu. I'm like, that would be nice, but that's not reality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to give someone a chance there has to be a level of intrigue and I think at some point eventually if someone keeps on rejecting someone over and over and over again and then they're single by the time they're much older then maybe their attitude would change but it could be a little bit too late so the nicer you are the more open you are to people people are very surprising and I always say to you know all men sometimes if they're single need a little bit of work so they take direction well so you can fix them up a little bit guide them in the direction that makes them a better package. Well, but then they say that you shouldn't look for a fixer-upper because women like to do fixing jobs. Emotionally fixer-upper, no. Um, you know, there's always counseling for something like that if there's deep-rooted problems. But I got to tell you, universally across the board, even CEOs and some men in business, they look great in the boardroom. They tank on a date like they're wearing ridiculous outfits. So that's what I'm talking about, spraying, you know, some little fairy dust to up their game. Single men as well, sometimes they don't eat well, I mean, or they do silly things or their etiquette may not be there. Those are simple surface things to change. I mean, I've seen women dismiss men because the guy doesn't tan well. You know, I don't like his belt. I don't like his shoes. I mean, yeah, exactly. You're giving me that eyebrow look. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So I'm talking just about the surfacey things. And if you like to do certain things, see if they're open to trying them with you as well. So a fixer-upper, it's like an old house that you want to renovate. So you're, you're not talking about a coat and paint and some other things, haircut, whatever. Those are simple, simple things to fix. These poor guys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we come in, I don't like your belt. I don't you need a new haircut. I don't, I don't know. It's strange because I don't really care. Maybe... 
I mean, I, I could stand to put more effort into my external appearance, I think. And so maybe that's why it doesn't bother me if a guy needs a haircut. Like I might say, well, he need a haircut, but it doesn't make me less attracted to him unless it's heinous or something. Then You're smart, Marie. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's talk about um, we're, we're talking about attitudes and there are things to, to do on a date that can be more effective and or less effective. So how, how does where should we start with that? Let's well, I want to talk about femininity because we were just having a quick little chat before. So at the end of the day, men want women to be feminine. And non-confrontational, you know, we have enough to deal with at work. And I still say that dating is traditional and old-fashioned. So, you know, we want the girl to be the girl or the woman to be the woman and the man to be in charge. So um, I tell women, don't dumb down. Uh, you know, ob- obviously be smart, but you don't need to compete with your partner and show them how smart you are. That will come through. So just make yourself available. And in terms of feminine, you know, we talked about this too. You were saying that uh, you've heard from women that they get really upset when the guy opens the door for them or stands up or whatever. And I actually tell the guys, these are non-optional things. This is what you should be doing. You know, chivalry is not there and manners go a long way. And we talked about paying on the first date. I tell the men it's not even a, an issue. Like men have to pay on the first date. It sets the tone going forward. You know, we want to know that you're still going to be able to provide for us down the road. It's a traditional thing. And the woman can make up for that, you know, down the road after you get to a second, third, fourth date. I've heard from 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 some of these women who don't like the chivalry thing. I'm I'm totally into chivalrous guys. If they're not, it really makes me feel yucky. But these women who don't like it, the reason they've told me is that they're worried that if a guy pays for dinner, they owe him something and that he's just going to be expecting sex or, or something like that. What, how do you respond to that? That's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's that they owe the guy nothing. You know, they're in a conversation. They're on a date. Uh, in terms of a first date, I actually recommend a short first date. I think dinner can be saved for later. Mm-hmm. The only objective of a first date should be to get to a second date. And just speaking about attitudes, people need to get out of their head. You know, you're not going from coffee or a cocktail to marriage. Like, slow things down, get to know someone. So keep the first date easy. But you know what? Just get to know someone and establish boundaries as well. Like, don't put yourself in a situation that makes you feel uncomfortable. No one can make you do something that you don't want to do. Wonderful. That's the thing. I mean, if you go out for for dinner or whatever the date is, whether it's a second, third date, I mean, if you're not going home with the guy, where is that sex going to happen anyway? There's nothing to worry about if you're not putting yourself in a situation where you might feel uncomfortable. Well, you could be cueing the guy, too, that you want to have sex with him. So he'll pick up on those vibes. And guys will try. I mean, that's in their DNA. And you just got to say, you know, you can do it really nicely and say, hey, Joe, you know, thanks for the date. And, you know, if he's putting the moves on you, just say, you know what? Um, I look forward to seeing you another time and you're going to have to wait. So good things come to those who wait. And um, you just have to establish those boundaries. Mm, I love that. Good things come to those who wait. You better be good. And guys (laughs) love the chase as well. So another thing, you know, there was a scene from Friends a long time ago where the girls are analyzing everything and, and the guys are just so simple. Let him pursue you. Don't roll over. Um, And guys love the hunt. But you need to be encouraging as well. So if someone's, you know, trying to communicate with you and see you, don't be so busy and overscheduled that you don't see the person for, you know, one month. Out of sight is out of mind. So it's a nice dance and a nice balance. But cue the guy, let him know that you're interested and let him come after you. Okay, but you deal with a lot of CEOs and high-powered people who don't have time to be out there yes. looking. But, I mean, there are men out there, people might call them beta men, who don't really do the chasing. They don't have the confidence. 
so is that always the right way to play it or well here's another thing so there's alpha and there's betas so alpha women often want an alpha guy um and there's been so many studies done too as women now start to surpass men at university and there's numbers that show that a lot of these women will become the alpha woman and she may become the CEO and the guy is more of the beta. So there's going to have to be a shift in terms of thinking. Um, that's the case where I think the woman, when I talk about cueing someone, you can say, here's my card, you know, really nice to meet you. I always say it's good to have old fashioned cards handy. Just if you meet someone, it could be a good contact for business or otherwise. But just let the guy know that you think he's great. If he's more quiet, just start complimenting them. You know, unless he's a cement head, he's not going to pick up on stuff. And then if you have to take it a little bit further because he is a bit more quiet, just say things like, I'd love to get together with you. You know, what would you like to do? Like cue him that far. But even the beta guys, I find too, you know, if the woman makes him feel secure, because it all comes down to rejection and fear in a lot of cases. You know, just smile, nod, reach out, you know, body language, touch. I mean, the guy's going to pick up that you're interested in him. So, and just if you have to prompt further, then do that. But still try to give him a little bit of the lead. What would you like to do, Bob, you know, on our next date? Give him a chance to try to plan stuff. All right. Well, it is time for a break. Thank you so much, Susan. We are speaking right now with Susan Seminu. She is the head matchmaker at Divine Intervention Matchmaking. You can find them at divinematchmaking.com. They are a national agency, a very hands-on boutique style matchmaking agency. Um, and you mentioned that you work with people all over the country. What about in, in the States? Is it just Canada? No, wherever we have scouts. I mean, a matchmaker, the traditional definition is we will look everywhere to find someone their match. And we often do a lot of coaching as well. People don't know they need coaching, but that's one of the value added things that we do. So wherever we have contacts, I mean, we work with people in those respective markets. You might advertise anonymously for someone, engage the services of someone else, and often, you know, Vancouver is our headquartered office, or we do a lot of work in Alberta in particular as well. There often is a Vancouver connection because who wouldn't want to live in Vancouver? It's so beautiful on the outside. Awesome. Well, this is Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and we're speaking with Susan Seminu from Divine Intervention Matchmaking. We'll be back with more Synchronicity in a moment. Welcome back to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and right now we are speaking with Susan Seminu. She is the head matchmaker at Divine Intervention Matchmaking. You can find them at divinematchmaking.com. And before the break, Susan, you had mentioned that some of your clients, um, they don't realize that they need coaching, but let's say they go on a date and you get feedback from their date. How does that work? Well, first of all, you have to be really direct and honest with someone. So we always do a date debrief. And it's fascinating to me how there's always two sides to every story. And, you know, often there's, you know, the truth in the middle. But a couple things. First of all, in terms of feedback, you want to ensure that your client and their match puts their best foot forward. So I mentioned earlier about fast tracking intimacy. We want intimacy with someone else, and sometimes we reveal, reveal way too much information too quickly. So again, your only objective on a first date is to get to a second date. The one battle area that someone should not talk about on their first date is about your exes or how much you've been dating, how many people you've met, you know what, it's going to be a no win situation. And I tell the men she will hold it against you. And this is a question that women often like to ask whether it's about your last girlfriend, your last wife, what happened? What was she like, whatever, 
just don't go there. I tell both parties, if asked directly about your dating past, the other person cannot handle the truth. That's a line in the movie in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So just deflect and say, you know what? We can always talk about that later and then change the topic. Let's talk about, you know, what you're going to be doing later this week or what you like to talk about or what you like to do in your spare time. Just establish common ground between the person across from you. That is the most important thing. It's about the two of you and do not focus on the other stuff around you. So in terms of the date feedback... Sometimes the guys always get tricked and they answer that question and that's the feedback that comes back as a negative. Oh, we talked about his ex-girlfriend. Oh, women, but this is the thing. We will ask guys questions and set them up and test them. And these poor guys don't know what they're getting into. And even like it might not be super conscious, but we'll ask men questions that we don't want to know the answer to. So I always tell the men they better be on high alert status. She is trying to trick you. So... The first date and in the beginning, in terms of feedback, I say don't focus on anything that's negative. If you have crazy relatives, you know, crazy pets, whatever, anything that is perceived potentially as negative, it is a no-fly zone. Do not go there. Everything has to be presented in a positive light. It's like going on a job interview. Why would you sit across from someone and the guy goes, what's your weakness? You better have a good answer to that question in advance and make that weakness a positive. And the analogy I always use too, when you don't know someone, you're looking for a reason to dismiss them or vote them off the island. Now, for example, if you have a history with someone and you love them for who they are, if they do something crazy like drink too much, you'll just go, oh, you know, that's just my friend. I already have a relationship with them. You're not going to give it further thought. But if someone does something ridiculous in the beginning, it's going to be a deal breaker. And one of those ridiculous things is drinking too much. I say do not get gooned on your first date. Watch your alcohol intake for sure. So that's some of the feedback stuff. The other thing too is we're very superficial as we talked about and very visual and very judgmental in the beginning. So look like you put some effort in terms of your date and how you're dressing. And women are looking at your shoes, men. So smarten up, no track shoes, (laughs) you know, wear pants that'll fit well, Um, you know, make sure that your grooming is done. Do not do overkill on cologne. That is like such a deal breaker. Same with perfume with women. And I tell the women, you know, men like feminine women. So in the beginning, you know, if you have longer hair, I say, keep your hair down. Don't wear it in a hair clip. Like I always like to do because I'm a little bit lazy and, you know, put some makeup on, wear an outfit that makes you feel confident and sexy. And men are suckers for heels as well, if you can wear them. I'm not talking skyscrapers, but, you know, look like a woman. If a guy wants to date a guy, he's gay. So, you know, maximize your female energy. That's what men are attracted to. And I tell the men, don't be a bum. Like, you know, check your teeth, check any stray hairs anywhere. (laughs) That can be a bit of a turnoff. And invest in terms of how you're looking. And then um, another thing, too, in terms of the date feedback, you really need to watch manners. So if you're going on a date, don't just order water. I mean, this has come up, too. The guy's just ordering water. Make sure that your date is taken care of. You don't have to do the dinner thing, but make sure that you're comfortable. And, you know, things like talking with your mouth full is ridiculous. And also, we talked about women trying to trick men in terms of questions. Women need to stop interviews, like interviewing guys like it is an interview. So, you know, rattling off their lists and just a barrage of questions. A date needs to be fun. If you can laugh, all the better. And I know first dates can be really awkward. That's why they have that show first dates, (laughs) because we know it's a fact. Get that first date out of the way. Keep it short and always leave them wanting more. But have some canned topics ready to talk about. People love to talk about travel, what they read about, their work, but make sure that it's not just like work focused. So you just have that work vibe and um, just make sure that you have fun and lighten up. Like just don't take things so seriously. And if people are nervous, like breathing is a natural relaxant as well. But try to have some questions ready as well. You know, some people are naturally great at having a conversation and some other people are a little bit more nervous. But all I can tell you is you want to present your best foot forward all the time.
And if people are looking for conversation questions to plan in advance, think about open-ended questions. Yeah, or just, you know, you want to see about common ground. So, I mean, the way that we work, you know, people typically have a profile. You know, I like to run, I like to walk. Like, so the sporting activities that you like to do. What do you like to do in your spare time? Because if you don't have common ground with someone, it's not going to work. So establishing common ground, you know, the types of things that you like to do when you go on vacation. You can talk about your family. And as I said to you before, if there's any crazy family members, don't bring those up either. Don't talk about the horrible relationship you have with your mother or your father, if you have that, or your sibling, because that's going to be a red flag to the other person. You can talk about your pets, as long as you don't have 10 cats in the house. So, you know, things that you love, talk about volunteering if you appreciate that. Talk about what you studied at school, the best things you like about your job. Just talk about what you love to do in, you know, our city, where you like to go away on vacation. It's common ground. So positive things. You can always talk, too, about what's going on in the news. There's always things going on or current affairs that are very entertaining. And guys, just make sure that you you know you're not with your buddy hanging out, uh, just talking about sports or whatever. Yes, some women like talking about sports. But make sure that you're interested and engaged. And it's a ping and a pong. There's a two-way flow. But really try to focus on the other person and listen. I'm going to, just as I'm looking at you now, and you're listening so intently, which I love. I'm listening, but I'm also like thinking of of things that that are coming up. Because the the family situation, someone, people always ask about family on a date, in my experience. All my family's dead. So how do you respond to something like that without bringing the mood down? So I would say that you've created a new family in this city that, um, you know, you've made your own family of friends, meeting some really interesting people here and just kind of deflect from the situation and not saying, because death is, no pun intended, a a killer. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a downer, right? So just say, you know, my friends are my family in this city. And, you know, we can talk about my past at another time. And I have some wonderful friends that are close that I think of um, like family members and just deflect. And I didn't bring up the word death in that. You know, you can leave that till later. And you've had the benefit of, you know, meeting so many unique people and you're creating your own family going forward. I don't know if that helps in terms of answering your question, but um you know, death is a very difficult area to talk about. So you, I always say you want to put a spin on everything. And you can craft that spin before you go out on a date. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And I can help you do that as well, too. Cool. Good to know. Because and, – and so you're not giving a lot of information. I mean, the family could be dead. The family could be in Malaysia or – you Vague. Yes. You know what? Vague is such a great thing. You're not lying – because that's a whole other thing. I think lying is a terrible thing. You know, it'll get your foot in the door, but then the truth will always come out, and that's just a terrible way to start a relationship. But just vague and deflect. And remember, again, put this positive spin on everything that's happened. If you've had something bad happen to you, and we all have, we've all had stuff in our life, just what have you learned from that in a positive way that you can move forward? And just one thing I wrote down before, we were just talking about the two-way conversation. One of the things that I get to, uh, especially with successful men, is the woman's like, oh, my God, he's bragging about his money and he's peacocking. Mm. He's peacocking because he wants to impress you. So, And men also know that women often value that. So that's a cement head maneuver that men often do, is they're trying to impress that woman And they're sort of on this monologue, soliloquy, talking about the stuff that they have because they think that's what she wants to hear. So she needs to set the tone and just sort of stop it and then try to get the conversation more real. But I tell women that's not necessarily a negative. He's doing that because he's trying to impress you with the stuff that he has. So you just need to be smart and dig deeper. Mm. So women should take that as a compliment because a lot of times I hear, and I've been guilty of this too, all he did was talk about himself. He doesn't care about me. He just cares about his himself. And that's generally the opposite. He's trying to impress the woman. In a lot of, yeah, in my experience, yes, that is the case because they know subconsciously, like that's how men defy themselves. 
uh, de- not defy, define themselves is by their kind of financial stability and, and things like that in their trappings. So if you get to a second date and he likes you and he asks you out again, instead of shutting him down, just change the tone of the conversation. And you can do that in the first date too, to try to get it to be more real. But I would not immediately default to a negative at all. People do stupid things when they're nervous and they're trying to impress someone else. So I always say cut someone slack. Um, you know, it's a first date can be awkward or just meeting someone as well. So sometimes everyone needs a little bit of direction. Do not, we're too quick to dismiss people for what I call sometimes ridiculous things. And you could even make a joke about it and just say, you know, that's great that you're telling me all the wonderful things that you have. You know, do you want to ask me some questions? You know, don't make it a negative, but you can still put a spin on it in a nice way. Mm-hmm. Or do you want to hear what I like to talk about? That's a good one. I like that. And Alison Armstrong, um, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but we've talked about her on the show before. She um, teaches about the difference between men and women and how they can meet in the middle and communicate. And she advises women to listen to learn because when two women have a conversation we interrupt each other and that's just part of how we talk and and women will look for commonalities and be like oh me too because we're we're listening to bond but with a man generally it's it's more effective to just listen to what he has to say and hear what he's telling you rather than trying to interrupt and let him know that you think that way too or, or share your opinion all the time. Well, I think you're always going to establish mm-hmm. common ground with someone in agreement. And at the same time, you're not going to agree with your partner on everything. So one of the key things is you need to learn to disagree in a fair way. And so uh, we are natural collaborators and we do want things to be nice and we don't often like to confront things, you know, when we're peacemakers. So just in that situation, yes, of course, you need to listen to the other person and you need to give them cues that you are listening to them because people want to be validated. And everyone has different communication styles, but the male of the species, you know, typically is not speaking as much as we are anyway. Um, You know, we tend to use more words. So I always tell women often in a lot of cases, like, be careful to zip your lips a little bit. Like, don't go on and on. They don't need to have the details and the minutiae. So it gets back to having fun. Laughter is the greatest antidote to anything. It can just really establish a nice bond. So um, just have a quick first meeting. And then a great thing to do in Vancouver or, you know, Western Canada is an activity on your second date. So just relaxing and listening. Make the other person feel like they have something to offer, even if there's not a romantic connection. That, I love that because you just want to, I mean, be there and have fun and help the person feel comfortable. If you do that, even if it's not a romantic match, you could make a good friend. You're practicing your skills for the next date there's a lot of benefits. Like a lot of times people will show up for a date and if they're not immediately wanting to jump on the person, they'll be completely cold and looking away and not being respectful. That is like the worst thing you can do. So you have to be respectful of every single person that's there. The mean mentality is not going to get you anywhere. And I get back to the karma thing too. And don't look at the person in front of you as your potential wife or husband. Like you need to chill. People need to relax. Again, this fast tracking of stuff, you know, oh, this is my husband that I'm going to have babies with. The guy's going to smell that he's going to bolt and run in the other direction. So just let things sort of unfold its natural course. And you never know who that other person would know as well that they can introduce you to down the road. But one thing that you just said about, you know, jumping someone's bones, <laughs> you know, right away, there obviously has to be a level of intrigue and interest when you meet someone. But also in my experience, I find too, when all you want to do is jump the other person's bones and it's like totally crying, crazy, just raw sexual energy, often that fizzles out really quickly because there's not the underneath the surface thing. You need to have chemistry, but you also need to have the other stuff too to sustain a relationship over time. And relationships take work and they take compromise because life is not easy. Like it's, you know, navigating roads. Um, 
But I also find, too, one of the key things today is that we just tend to commoditize human beings. There's so much selection out there, possibly, you know, with internet dating or Tinder or whatever it is. And we just judge people far too quickly on superficial qualities. People don't know how to present themselves well, sometimes in terms of their photos or whatever. We just say, forget it. We don't want to meet them. We need to give people a chance. And we need to focus on who's in front of us. Because when there's too much selection, you get confused and you don't make a good decision. So you need to give someone a chance and try to see them a couple times, three times before you make a decision. Unless they're really, you know, there's like a no-go at all, like just a horrible interaction. And sometimes you just don't get along with someone. Oh my gosh. That is, <laughs> I showed up at Starbucks to meet a guy from, I don't know, Plenty of Fish or something. And we hadn't even been in the same room for 30 seconds. And he tried to kiss me on my mouth. That's just weird. Right away. Yeah. And I was like, whoa. And I still, I, I still continued with the date, but then mm -hmm. he kept trying to be physical with me and to the point where, and then he tried to argue with me about it. So then I just, well, I, we were walking at the park at that point and I just walked away. I said, I'm, I'm done. I gave him like four chances. And that's the right play. You weren't feeling comfortable and that's what you, when you leave. But one thing I was going to say is that kissing is a good barometer, just not within the 30 seconds that you first meet someone. But a lot of times I will hear, you know, the guy knows that he's attracted to the woman and the woman's kind of not sure because his packaging may be a little bit different uh, be different than what she was anticipating, but she likes them. And so I always say that's when you want to go in for the kiss because a lot of things are solidified um, by that kiss. And sometimes the first kiss can be awkward too. So you might have to go in for two or three or four times just to get it right. But kissing is a fantastic indicator uh, in terms of, you know, potential chemistry as well. So if it's like kissing a dead fish, and you've given it a couple times, you know, that's a, a no-go zone. So typically, but a lot of times people go, wow, I can't believe that, you know, that chemistry or what I felt when I kissed them as well. Mm -hmm. it, that can be dangerous too, though. In terms of what you want to go into bed with them? Don't do it. No, like the, the person that I've been dating, I was like, he's younger and he doesn't, he's not in the same place in, of life as me. So I was like, yeah, you're adorable. And I'm attracted to you, but stay away. And then he kissed me and I was like, oh no, here we go. It was, yeah. So the chemistry is huge and you're, you're blushing. You're just <laughs> all excited talking about him. So Marie, maybe you're the primary breadwinner and you have to give him some guidance and give him a, a little bit of chance, you know, to catch up, mm -hmm. you know, but if he's not going to long-term kind of change the things that you want, that will end up being a deal breaker. But if you're enjoying it in the moment... And, you know, something's not ticking and you're totally cool with it and you're having fun, you can dictate the pace that you want. Because that is actually how men do bond with women. Your brains get hardwired based on those chemicals and, you know, the endorphins that are released and the oxytocin and all of those, the dopamine when you're kissing with someone in sex as well. Like that bonds people together. So that's why I love that reaction that you had there. <laughs> you know, it's just no. a question of what you want long term and no one else can tell you what's best for you. Exactly. All right. Well, we're going to take a break in just a moment. But before I forget, you have a ladies night. Is that what's coming? Yes. Up? On Thursday, November 5th. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So we are calling out to Vancouver single ladies on Thursday, November 5th from 7.30 to 9.30. And it's going to be a fun event. We're going to talk about some of the things that I've seen, uh, you know, matchmaking and dating in this business for nine years and teaching women how to present their best foot forward. We're going to have some fun. We're also going to have an astrologer there because I often come across women who don't want to date a certain sign. So he's going to talk about signs and love astrology. And we're also going to have a stylist present in terms of looking at women and I always say it's maximizing those assets if you've got fantastic boobs you highlight them in a great way so it's going to be a fun event we're, we're going to have some drinks and some appetizers and just help Vancouver single women up their game in the dating business and it's going to be held at Creekside in the Olympic Village Creekside is that a, a that's a community bar? center oh and there's parking underneath as well so it'll be an intimate evening of fun and, you know, fire away with all of those questions. 
Great. And is there, if people want more information, is there a fee for it? Or Yeah, it's $75 okay. to come for the evening, and um, we will have it on our website. And there's also a link on Eventbrite that we're going to be setting up on our website as well. Or you can just call our office, uh, which that information is on our website, divinematchmaking.com. Perfect. And we can give you more info. Awesome. All right. Well, it is time for a break. We'll be back with more Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul in just a moment. We are speaking with Susan Semenu. She is the head matchmaker at Divine Intervention Matchmaking. And if you want more information about the company or that ladies' night on Thursday, November 5th, you can go to their website, divinematchmaking.com. We'll be back with more Synchronicity in a moment. Welcome back to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and we are speaking with Susan Semenu. She is the head matchmaker at Divine Intervention Matchmaking, and you can find them at divinematchmaking.com. They are a very hands-on boutique specialty matchmaking company. Um, it's interesting, actually, we're going to talk about flirting and confidence in just a moment, but there are other matchmakers out there whether it's in Vancouver or other places where they only match paying clients pretty much, unless it's a super high paying client. I don't really feel like people are getting a deal if the only pool they have are the other paying members. So I sit on the board representing Canada on the Matchmaking Institute. It's an international organization. There's all sorts of different services and price points. And typically, the paying-to-paying model is often, you know, a dating agency. And um, I just find that most matchmakers that I've been in touch with, uh, you know, in other markets and the way that I work, if you limit yourself to paying members only, it's just way too restrictive. You can find someone anywhere. So you have to really cast your net wide. And depending on different price points too, often a lower price service, a lot of women are quick to join things and they're more vulnerable in a lot of cases. You go to the bathroom, you find out, you know, someone's on their period or something's going on and men hold those things back. So women join things and men can be slower to join as well. So there's an imbalance in terms of numbers. So that's not going to work either. But there's lots of different models and services that are out there. But... um, you know, and that begs the question, too, as we get older, you know, women start to outnumber men, single women. So you really need to cast a wide net, as wide as possible to be successful, I believe, in this business. And I always say, I don't care where I find someone on the elevator, in a street, not a street person, but, you know, walking down the street in lines at Starbucks. So a good matchmaker will do that. Cool. Okay, good to know. Because, yeah, I, I applied for a job with a matchmaking company a couple of years ago and I was really excited I was like yeah I want to help people find their matches and I found out that really what they do is they take people's money and that's it and that's why there's a lot of BS in this business too because um, it's like getting someone for a job if you're interviewing for a president or vice president you have to look everywhere to find that best person and work your contacts and sometimes some of our clients too have really specific interests you know I've had a guy who wants like a hot chick who rides a motorcycle so you know I I was one okay great so (laughs) we were working the motorcycle you know venue I mean it depends on what someone's looking for or a pet person or someone who's more spiritual or whatever like you have to think I say always outside of the box and good matchmakers the reason that we have a high success rate is you use your intuition you see people together and you have to pre-screen all of those things and you have to go out looking and how important is it to have mutual interests? So you don't want to date yourself because that's quite frankly quite boring. You want to be complimentary. And you cannot expect to do everything with your partner. That's just way too much pressure on the other person. You want to be a complete person on your own. But in terms of common interests, you know, I say to you have to look at things in the future. You want to have the same things out of life in terms of how you want to live your life. You know, if you've got one guy who wants to go camping all the time and be a free spirit and the other girl is a five-star girl, well, that's not going to work, right? So you've got to sort of ascertain what it is that you're looking for that you really want to do with the other person. And let's say skiing is a big part of your life. You know, is that person prepared to go 
at least into the snow with you, they might not want to go on the mountain. So you need to establish what it is that you want to do with that person, but recognize that they can't be everything. And I don't know if people here remember math and concentric circles. So you draw two circles and you overlap in the middle, you're both two people, but there's a portion in the middle that's common. So make sure that you have that common ground. You think certain ways similarly, and if you don't, you respect that other person's differences and it doesn't become a deal breaker. You know, things like religion, for example, too. Vancouver, uh, you know, being the most Asian city outside of Asia, is also the highest city in Canada for mixed unions in terms of religion as well, or diff, you know, multi-ethnic uh, pairings. And you know, the more open you are, the better, and those unions will work if you respect the other person's background and don't make it an issue. So if there's, and I do want to get to, to flirting, but if there is a subject, either it's an interest, uh, the guy that I'm dating is into WWE wrestling and yeah. always wants to talk about it, or it could be a different religion. How much do you have to participate and listen and talk about that interest versus just letting it lie and quietly respecting it? So I always say never ditch your girlfriends <laughs> when you're a girl. Same thing with the men. So, you know, if you want to participate and listen to him chat about it, whatever works for you in terms of balance and say, listen, you have uh, like one opportunity to talk to me about it once a week and then the rest you're on your own. Like whatever works out of respect. So it's your dance. And if it drives you crazy that he wants to talk about it all the time and can't get over it, well, then that is going to be annoying. But it's all about respect and what you can find that you like to do together and just say, I don't want to talk to you about this. I respect that you love it. I don't want to go with you to this event. Go invite one of your friends. And that's the night you go have a girlfriend night out. So you decide what it is that you're prepared to talk to that person about. Again, I'm going to use the word respect because that's so important. And then find out, you know, how you're going to navigate that. It's your particular dynamic. I always say no one knows what goes on behind closed doors. But you cannot expect to do everything with your partner all the time. It's impossible because we're like snowflakes. Everyone's different. Okay. Thank goodness. Cause I just feel like, like to be a good girlfriend, I should listen to what he's interested in, but, and I don't, I try not to roll my eyes. I try to be respectful, but there's only so much I can take and still look at him and want to jump his bones. Yeah. Don't roll, don't roll your eyes, but just no. say, Hey, you had, you know, whatever his name is, just say, Hey, you have 15 minutes to talk to me about <laughs> this today. And then we're moving on to something else that I want to talk about or that we both want to talk about. So get it all out and nod and say, yes, that's fantastic and fascinating. On to the next topic. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. So we have just a few minutes in the show. Uh, DJ Chris Arific is actually not going to be here today for Parts Unknown. So uh, he'll be back next week. Do you have to leave right at one? No. Okay. So we can go a little bit over if we need to. Um, so let's talk about flirting and confidence. So confidence is so key. I always say to men, nobody likes a drippy wimp. So women want to know subconsciously if that building's going down or there's a fire or there's something that's going on that you're going to come and save us. So that's why, you know, that height thing always comes into play. And I always say the word large and in charge and anyone can be confident. It's all about attitude and belief in yourself. And if you can sense that someone is weak, you know, or unhealthy or whatever, because, you, you know, it's all back to that jungle thing, right? You want to be with someone that's going to be positive for you. Um, confidence is sexy. So you need to figure out as a man or a woman, what makes you feel good and do more about it. And it's all about many wins. So, uh, in terms of the flirting and the body language, we're subconsciously attracted to men who take up more space. So I always take, uh, you know, time to tell the guy like stand, you know, with good posture, look bigger and men often like that's what you know, women always want to sort of feel smaller so you know that's just a subconscious innate thing as well and the flirting thing the most important thing is kind of your face as well and what you're doing with your arms and and things like that so you can't flirt with your sunglasses on so a lot happens with the eyes so when you're out in a bar Let's see. 
Oh, yeah, down. that's super sexy. <laughs> well, those aren't sunglasses. No. Those are glasses, right? So it's all about establishing eye contact. And I can't tell you as well, there's probably a few times where you look at someone and you look into their eyes and it's a flash thing and you kind of feel like a sexual chemistry, you know. And then I go like yeah, <laughs> yeah. because it's scary. So, so that's great. <laughs> so away. that's that's the dance, though. You look at someone as a man to a woman and then you should look away and then you look back again and that's the dance and do that a couple of times and when we're subconsciously it sounds very monkey and primal but that's kind of what we are in the jungle primates roaming the earth so the eyes are key the smiling you know blushing sometimes women get really or men you know they blush and they feel all flustered i'm like that's okay you know the other person's going to find blushing kind of attractive um, you know, you're getting that little hot, you were talking about kissing your guy and you were getting all, I was like, wow, I like that reaction. So another thing that we tend to do too, is we tend to primp or preen ourselves, like touch ourselves when we're into someone, you know, women will touch their hair, watch the hair flip when you're out and about. There's a lot of hair flippage going on, especially in an interview. Sometimes you see on television, there might be two subjects and the hair flippage, the licking of the lips. That's like wanting something as well. Those are subconscious cues. And what men do is their nostrils kind of flare sometimes. Yeah, look for the nostril flaring. The eyebrows get um, raised up as well. So those are some of the things. And pupil dilation can happen. When your pupils get larger, that's great. But body language and flirting too, when you're in sync with someone or you're trying to be in sync with someone, try to slowly mirror their behavior and it doesn't have to just apply to dating so if you're in a business meeting like arms crossed is like i'm not open for business so you need to watch that and you also need to watch fidgeting mm -hmm. fidgeting and nervousness um that can be a turn off as well so just try to be mindful of that and of course everyone can get nervous but that's when you breathe and just smile and try to ask the person another question. And remember, we all, we're flawed human, like we're humans. We're all flawed. No one is perfect. So um, just try to, you know, breathe, be calm. And the flirting, like you lean in to someone when you agree with what they're saying, you could nod your head, like look at them, pay attention. But the mirroring of your other person can get you guys in sync. I'm just going to say one other thing too as well, just for women as an FYI so they can be familiar with this. Women like to face each other when they're chatting. You know, eye contact, you want to establish that chemistry and that bond. The male of the species is often more comfortable side by side. Mm. So don't take offense. Like if you're sitting at a bar and you're beside the person, that's actually a good thing. Or sitting on a couch beside the person because that direct intense eye contact or even like a coffee and a walk is a good thing. It makes them feel a little bit more comfortable. And in the olden days, the jungle days, you know, men would line up beside each other and, you know, kind of try to go after their prey. So they're sort of still used to that kind of interaction. Mm -hmm. So, and men look away more too in conversation. And this has been proven. I have two boys, you know, sometimes a woman, the mother's going, you know, the daughter's making more eye contact and, you know, the boy, not so much. So this is just kind of ingrained behavior. So you look at the person, look away, you know, cut them some slack, try to do the side by side thing. It's their more kind of default area for comfort. And just watch your body language, like stand up straight. And a great pose for women, the confident pose is the model pose. You know, you put your hand on your hip, but smiling, I got to tell you, when someone smiles, it just changes their whole demeanor, especially for women. It's just like, it's so inviting. So Susan, it sounds like when, uh, for men, if you're standing side by side, it's more like you're on the same team. Mm -hmm. Rather, if you're across from each other, I mean, across at like a small table for coffee for yeah. a first meeting yeah. can be really intimidating because yeah. you're just, it's like you're almost going to be in combat. Yeah, and on the spotlight. So I actually find too, when I'm interviewing people, depending on if it's in the office or somewhere else, I try to be respectful or do something that does a little bit more of that side thing. Uh, that you're not just sort of like staring at the person because we look, we do a lot more eye contact as well. 
So um, definitely. And you could try to pick up on someone's level of comfort or not. Like women are very intuitive. So you can get a sense. And if you're, let's say you're out at a coffee shop meeting someone, and I'm all for coffee dates, by the way, or a cocktail, because I always say a cocktail takes the edge off, but you can Mm -hmm. just sit beside the person and just kind of lean in and look over at them as well, you know, from time to time. But just don't stare. Staring is kind of creepy. And then what about touching? Because I know that I can be quite touchy and I like to touch people, especially men. I'm comfortable with that, but then they all think that I want them. And But I'm, I do that with everyone. So what amount of touching is good flirting and what is maybe too much? Well, I think it depends on the situation and the person. So men will often take that as a cue that you're totally hot for them. And I always say that honesty is the best policy. You know, you have to read your situation. So if you're in sync and you're mirroring someone and there's good conversation flow, by all means, touch them, you know, but not too low. (laughs) I don't (laughs) On the lower unit or whatever, like on the arm (laughs) is fine. That's totally cool. But what if you think you're leading someone on and you're not interested, I always say too, men can handle the truth. You just got to say, you know what? I think you're a great guy. There's just no chance of a romantic connection. So if you've done that naturally and that's just the way that you are, because I know some women that I'm friends with too, they're very touchy-feely with me. I'm not as touchy-feely. They always want to like touch my arm. All of that is cool. But you just need to qualify it if it becomes a situation. But again, you have to be reading your situation. So if someone's leaning in when you're leaning in, if you're leaning in and they're leaning way back, that person's probably trying to bolt. Or if they're not looking at you, they're not, you know, they're kind of shifty and you get the sense that they want to bolt, don't do any of that touching stuff. So as long as there seems to be an openness. But again, um, you know, read the situation, read the person. Some people are huggers. Some people love to hug all the time. So just make sure that you're clear with that person if you've led them on. They can take the direction well and just say, you know what, I think you're a great person. You're just not for me. You will never have sex with me. Mm -hmm. But thank you. I have a great girlfriend for you. I have told told the guys that. But but what about like with me, you know, I'm quite open. I'm open to meeting new people. I'm open until I'm totally committed to someone I'm open and potentially available to date. So I might not have decided yet whether a guy is totally written off. So how do you balance that? Because, I mean, I've only had one or two men speak up about it to me, but they... Speak up in terms of what did they say? Uh, you are, you're too flirty. Uh, it's, you know, it's not fair, basically, that, that you be that flirty if you're not going to sleep with me. Well, I would just say, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's just the way that I am. I'm not going to apologize. And, you know, I'm pretty upfront. I'm going to tell you that you're right. I'm not going to sleep with you. So, but someone else will, you know, if you play your cards right. So just don't be that way. But I think it's important to lay the cards on the table and don't change who you are. And there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. I do think, you know, sleeping around with a bunch of different people at the same time is very confusing to you as a person if you're trying to find a mate. But I also try not to judge the situation. I mean, I'm trying to find people long-term relationships. So, um, you know, do what you need to do. But again, you're in control and establish boundaries and just say, you know, that's my personality. I'm very friendly with men and women. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just not interested in you. I think you're a great person. Like, don't take offense. Okay. Yeah, I'm not talking about sleeping with men. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if that's within your value system, great. But for me, I'm just talking about hugging, eye yeah. contact, arm touches kind of stuff. Yeah, so just tell the guy, you know, you're not for me and that's just the way that I am. But don't apologize for who you are. And if they get agitated, just say, you know, focus your efforts on the next person that you have a chance with. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, I find that people, especially men, but even women, are starved for physical touch. Mm -hmm. So maybe some people take it the wrong way. Well, men, it's in their DNA to want to get laid. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> I mean, they are going to try. So if you're putting those cues out there, they're going to go for it. And you just need to, you know, shut them down if that's not going to happen. And that's why they have surrogate huggers now. Um, and surrogate- What do you think of that? 
You know what? I mean, obviously, there's a reason for it. There are people that are starved, and there's also people that are super lonely that don't have any type of infrastructure there. So, again, I try to be open. It's not for me personally, but if it works for some other people and it's done respectful, who am I to say it's, you know, it's the wrong thing to do? That brings up another question if we have time. We're five minutes over. Is that okay? Yep. What about how do you? pick your clients? Because I can imagine that there might be someone out there who has no dating experience, very lonely. And that's why they not most of your clients, I'm sure, don't necessarily need a matchmaker. They're just very busy. But what about a person who is very lonely, doesn't have the social skills? Would you work with them and help them build those skills? So we work with people on a case-by-case basis. You're not going to like everyone. If I don't think we're going to have success with someone, I will turn them in another direction. At the same time, if someone comes in looking for the spotted unicorn and 0.001% of the population, see you. Goodbye. That's not going to happen as well. So people need to be realistic. And yes, some people are great. Everyone has a story. You know, a lot of people have issues. I always say right off the bat, nothing you're going to tell me is going to surprise me because there's just so many unique combinations of what someone is like. And you can present really well from the outside, but there's some things going on in the surface that need to be addressed. So as a matchmaker, you need to be non-judgmental and they've actually when we were at one of our conferences we all had our handwriting analyzed and that was one of the key things that came up is that we were all empathetic and we're highly non-judgmental I just happen to be really direct as well so yes we will work with people like that someone has to be willing to change someone has to be willing to possibly go in a place that's not comfortable for them you know they come to us as well what they've been doing has not been working so you need to be able to deliver concrete feedback and you there's so many different things that you can do to help someone get confidence in life and repackage themselves and put their best foot forward you know people are not a lost cause sometimes people are just lost in terms of what to do next so you have to look and you have to diagnose what the prescription is it's like going to a doctor so not every person that goes to a doctor is an open and shut case I mean some of the cases are complicated so that's why you have to meet with someone you have to know which questions to ask and kind of go from there and people are not cookie cutter But at the same time, in terms of how we match, you know, with men, I try to first, because they're so visual, I look at what their type may be. Men often subconsciously repeat the same type of person from the exterior, and that's their natural default. So I look for those things first, and then I call it retrofitting. You know, what are the common grounds? What are the interests? How do you think? You know, what's important to you? Talk about babies, all of that kind of stuff, how you like to, you know, lead your life. And then... With the women, you know, what are some of the things that they're looking for? Uh, Because, you know, of course, women have their lists, um, but it has to be a two-way compatibility. And when you've interviewed thousands of people, you get really good at doing this. It's like an executive recruiter. You've got a good sense for people, and sometimes you intuitively know that someone's a good match, like, just really, really quickly. Or someone can say something in conversation that just sort of tweaks you on someone else. So you have to have a good interest in people and a good retention as well for what's going on. But I have to tell you, one of the reasons that I'm in this business as well, you asked me earlier, is I wanted to be a therapist when I was younger, a psychiatrist. So this business... All of that psychology information comes into play because we are so impacted by our past, but you can't let it hold you prisoner. So that makes you who you are. And I always say to try to get someone when they're younger because you're not as affected by life experience. That's why we have price points for people that are, you know, 34 and younger. And then, you know, as you get older and life every decade, you know, you become kind of more set in your way. So you got to find the right crazy for you. (laughs) I love that. All right. Well, we have gone over time. This is Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and we have been speaking with Susan Semenu. She is the head matchmaker at Divine Intervention Matchmaking. You can find them at divinematchmaking.com. We talked about it a little bit earlier in the hour. um, Thursday, November 5th, if you're a woman, a single woman in Vancouver, then uh, there's going to be an event at the Creekside Community Center in Olympic Village. 
Village, um, 7.30 to 9.30 on Thursday, November 5th. And you can find more information about that 